Thanks. All right, well, thanks everyone for the opportunity to be here and speak and present my work. So the title of my talk is Toto Theory from Six Dimensions. Um, this is about some ongoing work with Daniel Jaffris, who's at Harvard, and uh, some of it is published, some of it is unpublished. Hopefully it will be published soon. So this talk is primarily about some interesting features of the 60, 2 comma 0 superconformal field theory that lives on uh, uh, n parallel n5 grains. So uh, to give a general review of this theory would take the whole talk in itself, but um, this is some abstract uh, SDFT that you know, string theory constructions motivate that it exists. It is the maximal possible dimension where a superconformal field theory can exist. It contains the ma maximal amount of supersymmetry, but nevertheless, we don't know that much about it. So it doesn't seem to have a Lagrangian. It's characterized only abstractly by some set of local operators. So, uh, so nevertheless, even assuming its existence uh, leads to a lot of interesting physics in lower dimensions. So let me talk about a particular example of that. So this theory here. Uh, can be put on any Riemann surface. Uh, this will be a Riemann surface. <coughs> Reserving n equals 2 supersymmetry. And this is a very interesting construction uh, because you get some theory. Let's call this theory T capital N of sigma. So N is this N here, so, uh, which is a 40 N equals 2 theory. And properties of this quantum field theory are geometrized. study case uh, is for instance it is this Riemann surface is equal to the points. So then just by assuming the existence of this uh, of this theory we learn something about n equals four super angles. So in this case T n of sigma is n equals 4 super yang mills with sun gauge group. So that n is the center. And it's a famous fact that there's a complex coupling uh, of n equals 4 super yang mills. Tau is tau of the torus. And now you see that if this statement is true, then of course, if this theory exists, it doesn't know any, about anything more than just the torus. So SL2Z is a manifest aspect of this construction. So this, this geometrizes S-duality. So more generally, uh, coming back to this, this setup, there's a lot of different properties that are known to be true about these kind of theories. So first of all, n equals two theories have a cool hole there. So the Coulomb branch, what is it? It ends up being a space of differentials, vector space of differentials. So which exact vector space it is depends on this capital N. For instance, in the simplest interesting case, when N is 2, this is the vector space of quadratic differentials. The second thing which generalizes this story here is that the coupling constants. Here, in the torus example, we had one complex uh, structure parameter, 
Uh, more generally, in our entire genus minimum surface, we have many, and we have a big space of coupling constants. Uh, a final one, which I like, is you could talk about the BPS particles. And these can be computed by some kind of geodesics. OK, so there's a whole host of properties here. Uh, there are many more. Uh, but the one that I'm going to focus on in particular is not on this list. It's, uh, it's what's called the AGT conjecture. So that's yet a further thing. So any n equals 2 theory in four dimensions uh, has an S4 partition function. So this partition function can be computed from localization, very analogous to the kind of things that Brian was talking about, that's about today. So what you get is an interesting formula that looks something like this. We call this like input z. Here is an integral z a, so this is a Coulomb branch parameter. And then we have two, two parts here. We have a classical action, like this. And then we have a kind of quantum piece. This is the absolute value of f of a squared. And this f of a is a generating function of instantons. This is a general formula in a gauge theorem of n equals 2 supersymmetry for this S4 partition function. It's been studied from a variety of points of view. Now you can ask, just like all these other things here that I listed that can be geometrized in this construction, what happens here in, for this particular observable, this S4 partition function? So uh, Aldai Gaioto Tachikawa uh, noted an amazing fact. So, they notice that this f of a is equal to a conformal block of the Toda field theory, which I'll review momentarily. And then this quantity here, therefore z, is a total correlation function. So this sparked a whole host of, of interesting uh, developments. And I'd like to tell you about how to understand this kind of statement from first principles. Uh, let's sharpen it a little bit. Let's try and under unpack the statement a little more. So let's think about the 60 origin of this calculation. In this calculation, there's both a Riemann surface and an S4. And we have some 60 theory on the product space. So we have 60 theory. And the total of Define on some group lattice of yeah, so I, I'm about to say more specifically, but but let's 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 actually say it now. So um, right, so total theories are labeled by your root lattice, and the one related to this construction is the S U N root lattice, where N is that N. Uh, and more generally, there's a A D E two zero theory, and you could run the same construction and you get the A D E total theory. 
<clears throat> so it'll actually be most natural to uh, discuss a slight generalization of this, uh, which kind of happens all at the same time. So we're going to consider the 2-0 theory on S4 mod ZK times sigma. So what I just described to you there was the case K is 1, where there's no quotient. Now, okay, this is some 60 theory, and you can put it on that six-dimensional space, and so you get, by some calculation, that partition. Now, if there are... Is, is it obvious what ZK we're talking about? Yeah, sorry, uh, I could specify that more uh, explicitly. There's exactly one that uh, is natural here. So, um, uh, so think of the equatorial S3 inside S4, and uh, ZK acts by um, by quotienting the hot fiber of that S3. Th that will be made also more manifest later. Okay. So what can we say generally about this calculation? So the 60 theory is conformal. So that means that this calculation is independent, this answer is independent of the overall size of this manifold. Now, there's a second fact, which is that when we put these theories on a general Riemann surface, we do it by topological twisting. So we, we couple in a way that makes them uh, insensitive to the metric on sigma. So topological twisting on sigma, uh, this implies that uh, z is independent of the size of sigma. So these two statements together mean that this answer is actually separately invariant under the size, changing the size of this and the size of this. So that fact allows us to develop two distinct interpretations of this calculation, and that's what's going on in the ATT conjecture. So the first involves the setup that I was talking about. So here, we think of sigma as being very small. That's a limit we can take and doesn't affect the answer. In that case, when sigma is very small, we get this theory that I was talking about at the beginning, Tn of sigma. Now we can take that theory and we can put it on this geometry. So that's the calculation, uh, the interpretation that I developed over there. Now we get this interpretation of some kind of instance on partitional function. But we can now do things in the opposite order. So it's independent of the order here because we can take this to be small. So we get, if we reduce here, we get some 2D theory. Uh, we don't know what it is. And then we can put it on sigma. So what is the content of this statement? The content of this statement is that the 2D QFT that I get there is in fact equal to what's called the para-toda theory. So that's a slight generalization of the toda theory. So, so AGT is that this equals para-toda theory. If that's true, then all of these, uh, this kind of phenomena will be explained very simply. Okay, so what's the paratonic theory? So, well, it involves two kinds of fields. Hmm. 
you've got fermions, psi i, well, they're actually the pair of fermions. These are fields in two dimensions that will live on the Riemann surface that I was talking about. Then we've got bosons phi i. And i here goes from 1 up to the rank of SUF n minus 1. And uh, k over there will we'll do the same k when I start right here. So the action looks as follows. We take SUN at level k, and we form the coset. So this is a theory that would be governed by the parafermions, the standard coset construction. Now we're going to couple it to the bosons. So we have some kinetic term. Plus some over i of psi bar i psi i times the kind of exponential potential. So what so k is that k? Um, so k is discrete here. Yeah. P is continuous. And C is the Carton matrix. do a couple reality checks on this action. So the first is I claim that this is a conformal field theory. So that means this interaction should be marked. Oh. Yeah. So the scaling dimension in the parafermion theory of uh, psi bar i psi i is 1 minus 1 over k. A little coset here, in fact. Now, what about these uh, these fields here? These are like Boulevard fields. They shift under conformal transformations. Third question. So, when, when k is one, yeah, I'm gonna. These are supposed to be regular fermions. No, oh. when k is one, the coset model is trivial. So, so uh, th then then sort of everything will reduce to an ordinary total here. Um, so that, that's supposed to be indicated here. When k is 1, this becomes a dimension 0, for instance. So k equals an identity? Where do I get regular from? Uh, k is 2. Um, I think. Yeah, then you have a dimension half half. On, th this is like the left of the Oh, oh left. Sorry, sorry. This is, uh, this is the left of the dimension. Yeah. The right of the dimension is the same. Um, right. So then, uh, right, and, and the left moving dimension of this field here, well, okay, we've got an overall factor of b over root k, and then we should multiply it by the shift here. The shift is uh, b over root k plus the inverse over root k, and then we do the quantum correction, which is minus b squared over k. So that's this is which of course simplifies to uh, one over k. So this interaction here is marginal for all k and b. Okay, and then uh, indeed, as, as we were saying before, some special cases. So first case, first simplification is k equals 1. Then the coset stuff is trivial. Uh, another special case is 
uh, and, right, and then this is just ordinary code. Another special case is n equals 2. Uh, then this, this total part is just the ordinary rule. And we just have one scalar with the e to the b plot. And actually, this is the, the pair of rule. And finally, if n is 2 and k is 2, the case that we were just talking about, that's the super rule. Right? So that theory has super symmetry. Okay, are there questions about this? Setup. So our, our goal is to uh, get as close as possible to deriving this action from some kind of construction of this. You have final series of how many people can do it? Two dimensions, right. Start with six, come down. Start, start with six, we're going to put it on this space, and we're trying to get literally this 2D3. Somehow. There are all these total theories you get by starting from 2D CFTs and making small deformations. Uh, are these going to be connected to those? Okay, so that you're getting? You know, when you deform off the conformal form. Mm, um, you mean like when you try and you know, define non critical strings by integrating a removal field and stuff like that? No, just take any of the normal 2D CFT. Uh -huh. And sometimes you can deform them by adding mm. some relevant operators and just make it to 2D. We won't have that exactly, but we will find the Toto theory emerging from a kind of slightly less mysterious 2D CFT, which is a WZW model. So we will find that ingredient somewhere in this construction. Okay, so. I mean, this theory doesn't even have a Lagrangian, and I'm proposing to do some kind of intricate Kuhn's applying reduction of it. So we're going to have to develop some kind of perspective. Uh, so we get started, though, it will be helpful to do some geometry on this space. So, so let's look at the 6D metric here, the starting point. So what have I done here? So first of all, this is the Riemann surface part, and this whole thing is the four sphere part. And I presented for you the four sphere in an important way. There's some coordinate sigma. Sigma equals zero is one pole, and sigma equals pi is another pole. And then in the middle, we've got S3 mod ZK which is kind of the equator, and it's varying in size. That's this part over this interval. So when you get all the way over here, it shrinks to nothing. And when you get all the way over here, it shrinks to nothing. This is, a, this is a useful perspective. It's still somewhat complicated, though, and we can do better because we can exploit the conformal symmetry of the 6020 theory to simplify this picture to make it a little bit easier. So let's do a conformal transformation uh, to remove this factor from here and put it over here. So
So now this will just be its own factor by itself. transformation to get to this, uh, this metric. So, uh, this, the problem that we're interested in on this four sphere mod zk is equivalent to studying uh, this space here. So what's happening now? So now uh, this sigma interval, which was metrically an interval before, finite length has been stretched to infinite length. Meanwhile, uh, the S3 mod ZK is now no longer varying in size as we're going along this, this space. It's just constant size. And finally, I paid, I paid a little price because the Riemann surface became kind of warped over this interval. And this is Okay, so finally, one other comment we should make is that some something happened, which is that it might look to you like I sort of lost some information that was sitting in the holes here. And that information is still here, just uh, sitting at some boundary conditions. So data from the poles. Sigma equals zero and pi. Now decoded by boundary conditions. At infinity in this interval here. So we'll, we'll have to come back to that and understand that point in great detail later. It does have an anomaly. Uh, right, so the, the 6203 has a conformal anomaly. Um, so that will modify the partition function by in a known way. Um, but uh, it doesn't, because for instance, this conformal transformation that it didn't depend in any way on the Riemann surface, it won't, it won't affect like, the affected action on the Riemann surface. It's just some overall factor. <clears throat> okay, so what can be our strategy now? So I made the geometry look a little simpler. So the, the strategy is to split the problem into two steps. So step one is reduce first on this lens space, S3 mod ZK, to get some effective theory. <clears throat> Step two is to reduce to some theory of edge modes. sigma after having taken into account those boundary conditions. So the reason this is a useful way of factorizing the problem is that a couple years ago I studied the reduction on S3 mod ZK in a lot of detail. So uh, this step has already been solved, so uh, I will now review that answer. So what is, to state the answer and then review it, but what is the effective field theory that we can get? So the effective theory in 3D is complex 
and sine and square. By that I mean turn Simon's theory was k through SL and C. So uh, normally when we study gauge theories, we don't like complex gauge groups. It's because uh, the kinetic term would make them have uh, not unbounded energy, unbounded from below. But when we're talking about turn Simon's theory, that objection is moot because the Hamiltonian is zero anyway. Uh, so complex gauge groups are fine to study. This is just some other topological field theory. Uh, so, but nevertheless, this is a kind of novel answer for, uh, for this reduction. So I'll explain a little bit about where that comes from. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm about to say that right now. Uh, so, so what is the action and, and so forth here? So the dynamical variable is a, vari is a connection B to be written as A plus I X. So this is an SLNC connection, this is an SUN uh, gauge field, and this is an ordinary adjunct. So A and X are standard. The action looks as follows. There's a coupling constant T times the turn Simon's function B plus another coupling constant T tilde <coughs> turn Simon's function of B ball, the complex conjugate. And now as anticipated, T and T tilde, these coupling constants are somehow related to K uh, and other parameters that might have entered the construction so far. So T is equal to K plus S, this is in general, uh, and T tilde is equal to K minus S. So uh, th this is for a general complex transignment theory. K is discrete and quantized, and will be equal to the K that we had in this construction. S is a continuous level. And in the problem that we started with where we have the round sphere, S actually vanishes. Uh, but more generally, if we uh, squash the sphere in some way, we can get a non-vanishing S. So this is an interesting fact that complex transcendence theory has these two distinct coupling constants. Okay, so this is the theory, but I didn't really explain where it came from, so let me do that a little bit now. So I'll give you a little short review about how that could come about. So it, in in the round sphere that we were just that I taught set up, uh, s is equal to zero. And if you want to obtain a non-trivial s, you take a metric here, which is not the round metric. You kind of squish it a little bit. So. So, so to say, um, to, to say the squat, the squashing more explicitly. So, what well, we're going to need right now uh, to, to, to review this. Um, so, we view this lens space as a hot vibration. round metric on the three sphere with some radius r, then this has radius r and this has radius r over two. This is the round metric. Um, if you want to define an interesting squash metric, you change the ratio of where you have it. So change this to be, uh, if I call the radius here l uh, r over two, then s will equal 
square root of 1 minus L squared. So that's a funny fact that just come, pops out of the gravity. But, but that's how you get non-vanishing x. You change the ratio of radiologies. OK, so why, why did I say we should view the lens space as a hot vibration? How can that help us understand the statement? The reason has to do with the fact that, well, as I said before, we don't really know any action principle for the 6220 theory, but we know one really significant dynamical fact about it. The one really significant dynamical fact is that the 2 zero theory produced on a circle of radius r is equal to uh, 5d maximum supersymmetric angles with gauge group SUS. So this is the one dynamical fact that we know. It was strongly motivated by, say, string constructions of this theory, where m5 brains reduced on a circle give rise to d4 brains. OK, well, we're trying to put the 2, 0 theory on this space, but this space has a circle in it. So we could just use this statement. And that's how you can derive these kind of things. So we should check, though, that is this really legal to do this reduction? We, we'd like to preserve supersymmetry. Our, our parent construction, where we put the theory on the four spheres, is supersymmetric. But can we really do this, this intermediate circle reduction and still have supersymmetry in five dimensions? So the way to address that is uh, you know, the, the compactification on S4 on ZK, where you can derive this, preserves the supergroup OSP to slash 4. So uh, what is this? Well, the SP4 is a round isometry. And the O2 is some R symmetry. So if we want to understand whether we can do a circle reduction preserving supersymmetry, we have to understand if there are any supercharges inside here that are neutral with respect to the U1 orbit described by this circle. Uh -huh. And this is for the round. Yeah, this is for the round case, yeah. yeah. But yeah, this watching kind of comes along for the ride when you get to the end. You, you don't need to really worry about it. Um, yeah, in fact, this statement that I'm saying right here is actually strictly speaking only to k equals 1 in the SEC. Um, but it, this will be enough to understand the logic of why you can do this reduction. OK, so what are the supercharges in there? So they transform as a 4 plus the spinner of the SO5 with some charge in this O2, some positive charge, direct sum with 4 minus. Now, if I take this SO5, that was from the SO5 point of view, and I want to find that 3 sphere, that's the equator. So I better break this isometry or view it from the point of view of SO4. That's the isometry of the 3 sphere. This is SU2. And this is it. In that case, this becomes the following representation. Okay, but now we can see whether or not this reduction that I was talking about is preserved supersymmetry. So this is how the supercharges transform under rotations on the three sphere. The U1 inside any particular one of the SU2s is the hop U1. Um, right, because it has no force point. So if I pick, say, the U1 here, and I reduce uh, to five dimensions there, I preserve the supersymmetries that are uncharged under that SU2. So I preserve so reduction to 5D. 
that will preserve these guys. 2, 1, plus, plus, uh, 2, 1, minus. So force of reduction. So we're in the clear. It's an allowed thing to do to do this reduction. OK, and then, uh, then you can start to assemble the ingredients. So uh, I'm, not going, I'm not really deriving this kind of statement for you. But just to demystify it a little bit, Once we're in 5 DNA mills, we have a Lagrangian. So we have a kind of, we have at least a starting point for doing KK reduction and trying to understand what we get. So, <coughs> first thing we need to understand is what are the origin of this complex transcendence field? Well, now it's kind of clear. This A is the ordinary gauge field in five dimensions, and this X is some of the scalars. They've been kind of added together in an interesting way. To get some of the transcendence levels, well, note that there is a Ramon Ramon transcendence coupling. Right? So if you have the standard gravity photon field, it couples to the instanton density in this way in five dimensions. This could be written as the integral of dc, which turns on into a. And here this integral is over s2, which is the base of the hot vibration, times the remaining three-dimensional space. Now, dc measures the churn class of this hot vibration. So when we do this integral, this just integrates over the two sphere to give k. So this, for instance, is the origin of my identification of k with part of the turn sign. It's just that multiplies the ordinary turn sign this term for a in the three dimensions. OK. What about the complexification? How does that come about? There's a kinetic term. So, uh, just you did this from thinking about a, a string effective action, or is this something that's just a statement about the 5D superannuals? I'm just taking the 5D superannuals <coughs> and I'm just putting it in a kind of supergravity background, if you like. Right. So, there's a metric background and there's a Ramon Ramon one form background, which comes from the hot gauge field here. Um, and there is also an R symmetry gauge field background, which I'm going to discuss now. And the trace of F squared goes away that you need to array. The, the, um, the kinetic term, yeah. Yeah, so right. So there's an ordinary kinetic Yang Mills term for this, but once you know that you have the turn Simons action, it will dominate it. So we get to ignore it eventually. It's, it's still this, this, this coupling, the Ramon Ramon coupling from the super gravity background. You really only understand that that's what happens from the string construction you're saying of the two zero theory. In other words. Yeah, I mean, you can, you, so you can, from first principles, write down 5D super Yang mills in completely general super Yang backgrounds. So that's a thing you can do just in the standard field theory. Just got a couple, with, you know, couple of the stress tensor of. of of 5D super Yang mills linearly the sources, and then you could kind of uh -huh. super symmetrically complete it. And then you'll see that there, well, there, uh -huh. there is such a field here, and it couples in this way. So that would be a field theory kind of bottom up approach. But mm -hmm. of course, that's not why I knew that that thing was there. I knew it was there because we know from deep in physics that it should be there. OK, so that, that's the origin of the, um, of the Chern Simons part for the ordinary gauge field A, but what about this complexification? Well, there's a kinetic term, some big D of x squared, x with some scalars in five dimensions. What does this really look like? So 
Set the covariant B with respect to A. It's like this. So V here is an R symmetry gauge field. Now, I didn't talk about that yet. I just talked about putting the theory in a metric background. Uh, but in fact, in order to preserve supersymmetry, I mean, the space that I was talking about, for instance, S4, it doesn't have any covariantly constant spinners. It's not a standard supersymmetric background. In order to preserve supersymmetry, you have to turn on other background fields that compensate for the fact that it's not, that there are no covariantly constant spinners. And one of them is this R gauge field. And so what this does is that it, it gives another first order kinetic term. So you get something like DAX like X when you take into account this V. And so again, there's a second order kinetic term bit from the uh, original yang mills kinetic term for X, but that actually goes away in the infrared because the first order term dominates. <coughs> so this, this gives the complex part, uh, some piece of the complex part of the term Simons. And then finally, uh, one thing to say is there's, this, there's a kind of big puzzle that I haven't resolved for you, which is how did the gauge group change? I, I said that we're in 5D super yang mills with SUN gauge group, but I claimed that the answer had something to do with SLNC turn Simon's thing. So how could the gauge group possibly change? That seems really impossible. Even if I could obtain the effective action of turn Simon's, this gauge group would never change. There's a related puzzle, which is what's happening with the fairbanks. This is a supersymmetric compactification of a supersymmetric gauge theory. So I can't just end up with some bosonic theory. I have to end up somehow with a supersymmetric theory. So what ends up happening here, and this is really the most non-trivial step, um, but there is a paper on this, so feel free to read more, is that the fermions are there, but they are Fidea and Popov ghosts. SLNC to SUN. So what you find this way is, is a, a funny presentation of SLNC turn Simon's theory. You find uh, an action plus a gauge fixing term plus Fidea Popov dose that implement that gauge fixing. And so if you were to integrate out the fermions, you undo the gauge fixing and get back to turn Simon's theory. You haven't done any topological twisting. This is not any topological twist. So, so how do you determine um, this? So, yeah, the question is, the question should really be how do they change their kinetic term from first to second order, right? So, um, you start out with an ordinary getting those first order kinetic term. And now you're instructed to do some zero mode analysis on the two sphere with these background fields on. And so what you find is that, uh, so there's a zero mode chi. So you find something like chi slash plus omega squared. So the zero, there's a zero mode chi. But because of the structure of the background fields, it only couples to a non-zero mode. Now, this non-zero mode has a mass. So you cannot just naively truncate to the spectrum of zero modes. You can't just delete lambda. Then the action for the chi will just go away. That's not wrong. That's not right. So in order to correctly obtain the action for zero modes, you actually have to integrate out this field. And if you integrate out this field, you get, you get a second order kinetic. So it's kind of tricky. That's why this is really the most but yeah, you can really see this just from the zero mode analysis. It, this phenomenon, I mean, it can only really happen because the, the background fields that are turned on are not just a metric. It's really important that they're not just a metric, otherwise it would never happen. 
Okay, so that's that's a little overview of of uh, of that step one. So, now we have SL, NC, and Simons, and we want to put it on on uh, sigma times R. In principle, I should take into account that funny metric that I was telling you about before, but now it doesn't matter anymore because SLNC turns Simons is a topological filter. So, crucially though, and you were going to twist on sigma. Right, but it also doesn't matter anymore. I mean, it's kind of built into the construction. It's twisted on this whole three manifold now. It's all it's just completely topological. No, it, it just seems confusing. It, it seems confusing that it is topological? Uh, yeah, because uh, going the other direction, you need to twist on the sigma, and then you got um, the, the 40 theory that you can study on S4 without a twist. Mm -hmm. And here, you, you studied it on, you compactified on three dimensions without any twisting, and you get something topological. I don't know. Well, I mean, the background is not a product, so maybe I should, I should there is a clarification that this can be made. Um, although the metric is not a product, uh, the metric is a product, rather, the, the other background fields are not factorized. So the, the, the background that I was talking about, S4 times sigma, is always topologically twisted on sigma. It's, the novel thing here is that it developed a kind of extra topological invariance in the other direction, but it was always topologically invariant on this part in the whole construction. Okay, so we have this complex from Simon's theory, and now we're going to do a kind of standard edge mode analysis of this complex from Simon's theory, something that people used to do in the late 80s. Um, okay, so, so what are the boundary conditions? It out. So the only way that we can figure it out is to use again the Yang Mills description and use what we know from that. And I think what he's saying you could put any three dimensional space at this level. You don't have to put R to the Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the, I mean when when we studied the theory on uh, three sphere um, and the lens space. We were interested in what the result was in general in the result for many three dimensions. And it's always a SL and C from Simon's theory. But you're saying when you study on the three sphere, you did or did not also have You also three twist three on the remaining three manifold the yeah. whole time. Yeah. The whole time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the, the non trivial thing here is that, I mean, that informal transformation that I did maps one construction to the other. Okay, so let's focus in on one of these boundaries. So in the original conformal frame, we had sigma equals zero. And some, something's going on over there, but we're not worried about it right now. And here we have f of three minus dk, and it's shrinking to zero. Here. Okay, so the first thing is that you might worry that there's no hope to ever describe such a condition configuration in 5D angles. Maybe something singular is happening here if I try to describe it in 5D angles. How can we argue that that's not the case? Well, one of the fascinating things about the relation between 5D Yang Mills and the 2 0 theory is that the radius of the hop fiber is equal to G Yang Mills squared. 
kind of inverse relation from what you now you would expect when you do the natural induction. So if you have this kind of relationship, you see that here the radius of the hot fiber is going to zero. So therefore, the effective coupling in five dimensions is going to zero here. So therefore, this is a weakly coupled boundary. So again, it's helpful to think a little bit from the point of view of, um, say, M theory, if you like. Uh, we have some M5 brains, a stack of M5 brains, and we're putting it, uh, we're reducing on the hot fiber, and something is shrinking, this, this whole free sphere is shrinking, as I mentioned before. So this is the same geometry, boundary conditions. D4s ending on D6s. In other words, reducing on the hot fiber here is the standard way of getting D6 breaks from M3. So we're supposed to put whatever boundary condition is appropriate for that situation. So these are called non-pole boundary conditions. they define. So we have three scalars, xA. They were like the imaginary parts of the gauge field. And near sigma equals zero, they develop a singularity. These TAs are generators of an SU2. So which SU2 are we talking about in SUN? It's such that the raising generator T plus is this big nilpotent matrix. Like one maximal Jordan block. So zero is just on the super diagonal. boundary conditions that are known to describe D4s and the D6s. And we could try and interpret them in terms of our transcendence theory in a straightforward way. So remember my complex connection with B equals A plus I X. I told you what X is doing. Uh, a is determined by solving the equations of motion for B, so the behavior is already fixed. And what this tells us is that this goes to uh, T3 over sigma D sigma plus T plus over U. So this is uh, as sigma goes to zero. These are our boundary conditions. As sigma goes to zero, the gauge field has some kind of singular polar behavior with these, these components here. Yeah. Plus regular stuff. Plus right? regular, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. All the other parts of these. Yeah. Right. Th these are the propagating fields. These are going to be the edge modes that we're going to try and discuss. But uh, these are going to set the boundary conditions. So here u, I should say, u and bar are complex coordinates on sigma. OK, so um, how can we, this seems like a weird boundary condition. Before diving into the details of that, it's useful to notice that, in particular, U 
bar is equal to zero. That's the boundary. So the way we'll analyze the boundary conditions is that we will first figure out this one. That's very easy. And then we'll strengthen it by considering those. OK. So we've got Trent Simon's theory. And we're setting a component of the connection along the boundary to 0. That's a very familiar boundary condition in Trent Simon's theory. This is the boundary condition. Which reduces Trent Simon's theory to the chiral WZW model. So this is the, the famous uh, Witten analysis from the original Trent Simons. So here, I'm just discussing one boundary at sigma equals 0, and I'm telling you that there's some chiral mode living there. On the other side, on the other boundary, we're going to have the anti-chiral side, and they're going to fuse together to make an, a whole theorem. OK, so people are probably familiar with this in, in the context of SUN. In SLNC, it's not any more complicated. And the complexification doesn't do that much to modify this problem. So what happens is that you write D is G inverse DG. So G is SLNC value. And it's a function of U and sigma over. So the u bar dependence goes away because of this boundary condition. So that's, this g is the, is the chiral wzw variable. So if we didn't have this additional complication, that would be the end of the story. We would have said that the answer is some kind of SLNC wzw model. That's a little exotic, but that wouldn't be, uh, that wouldn't be so bad. But we have to still understand what this is doing. Yeah, uh, sorry, sorry. I mean, the, uh, you, you write B as G inverse DG on the whole free manifold, and then the edge modes are when you set sigma to zero. Yeah, yeah. So the the sigma dependence can um, can be removed by gauge transformations is the point. So that that's why it reduces to a theory. Of Maybe I should also say that, that the central charge of the chiral WCW model uh, can be computed in a straightforward way by a calculation that's pretty similar to the, to the ordinary SUN, which is you get a different formula. The formula that you get is this one. Try and re get that formula from, to rederive that formula from another one in a minute. Okay, so now we have to understand this strengthening of the boundary condition. So let's write G is equal to O of G of U and VXP of log sigma times H. So this is just a shift of variables. I'm going to try and study what's going on with little g of u. So if g of u is equal to e to the u t plus, this is the non-pole. So 
So in other words, if you plug this in here and compute G inverse DG, you'll get that, that B. Uh, the fluctuations um, give of this little G will give the, uh, the full edge modes that we're looking for, but, but we have to constrain them in some way such that we don't get any more singular terms there. So that's a straightforward analysis to do, let me, let me say what the answer is. So if you write G inverse DG, this is the WZW current. And if there weren't any non-pole, it would just be a completely general matrix that would be uh, holomorphic. Yeah, sorry. Uh, right, so, so this is the WZW current. If there were no non-pole, that would be the end of the story. But since there is a non-pole, these currents get constrained. So what we find, let's call this J. The non-pole implies the following interesting current restrictions. Yeah, 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 right here. Yeah. Yeah. There's a D sigma over sigma and a D U over sigma bit. So right, so demanding that you don't get any more singular terms when you plug into this formula tells you certain very simple constraints on this current. It tells you that if you look at J and you project it onto the positive roots. call them i, then this is equal to a constant, mu i, which is non-zero if i is simple. That's to reproduce the pole itself. And zero otherwise. That's to make sure we don't get anything more singular. We also have to restrict the Cartan directions. We get that. So that's quite nice. The, so, so you partition the roots in the positive form? Positive. To po yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or, yeah, relative to the T3. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Those for which it has positive and negative eigenvalues. And, and that's. When you, when you plug a general G in here and you work out which kind of singular terms you'll get, you can see that it's the sign of the eigenvalue T3 that will control that. So this is what you find. So th this is quite an elegant restriction um, with some very natural uh, reduction of the WZW model. And uh, in fact, stuff like this has been studied a lot in the past, these kind of current constraints. So I claim that the SLNC WZW model with these current restrictions is in fact the para Toda theory just in disguise. So let me show you how to see that. Let's look for simplicity at the SL2 case. So let's write G to change of variables to implement the constraints in a simple way. change variables on G in this way. This is a Gauss decomposition of SL2. So X, Phi, and Y are some new variables. The reason for doing this is that we'll see that these current constraints are very simple in these variables. OK, 
okay, so there's only one positive root. So that condition just says that J plus, as you can work out from this, is just e to the minus 5 partial x is equal to mu. Now, on the other, so far I was focusing on just one edge, but remember we have two edges, so we have to take into account the opposite chirality constraints that we get from the other side. So we get j bar, and on the opposite side, plus and minus are reversed. So we get j bar minus, which is equal to e to the minus phi d bar y. This is some other constant, let's call it mu. Both mu and mu are non zero. So that takes care of the, the positive roots and on the other side the negative root. Finally, we have to take into account the J0 constraints. So they look like this. This was just algebra, just rewriting the constraints there in terms of these new variables x, y, and y. Okay, but now we can easily solve them. So, how do we solve it? Well, we plug in here and eliminate this combination in favor of mu. Uh, then you can take d bar of this equation. That's zero because the equation of motion is uh, d bar j zero is zero, uh, and equivalently d j uh, zero bar is equal to zero. So if we take d bar of this thing, then we can uh, eliminate this guy, d bar of this, using this constraint. And so using that together, what you find is that, first of all, x and y can be eliminated because of the first two things. And second of all, phi obeys the following equation. So that's the Louisville equation. Almost there. So, what's the almost? Well, I told you we were going to get some paramovel theory. And the reason we have to work a little more is that phi is actually a complex variable because we're doing SL2C. So, how, how can we see that this is really a kind of fermionic variable coupled to an ordinary neutral field? The way we see that is you note that phi here, the imaginary part of it is naturally periodic. Therefore, you can fermionize it, since we're in 2D. When you do that, you find exactly uh, the parafermion you know, action, and you, you find, uh, in fact, this very specific value of b. You find this by just diagonalizing the thing. So just as a check, let's uh, we can try and figure out what is the central charge of the paratota here. Yeah, sorry, how, how am I ensuring that it's periodic? Yeah, we know that we know that it's periodic, so then we suspect that it fermionizes. And I'm not actually deriving for you the like precise way to fermionize it. That takes a little bit more work. Um, it's, it's not obvious that it has to be It's not obvious, no. Uh, I mean, you have to, you have to go through a little something. Um, that's somewhat interesting. I'll, I can tell you about it afterwards. But 
Yeah, there's something to say. But anyway, that, this is the idea that you fermionize to, to find the, to split it into the real part of phi, which is like an ordinary Louisville field, and the imaginary part, which can be fermionized. Um, good. So I said this was B. And as a gut check, well, you cannot write down a standard operator relation like psi equals to normal order with the I. Imagine the phi. It's more like psi is related to the cosine of the imaginary part. Uh, cosine. It, it's a little bit tricky, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, there's some there's some words to say there. It's not it's not completely straightforward. It, for instance, you have to understand why there's a K that's important there. Uh, it, it can't it has to be K dependent to fermionization. So one one way to just to say some words and say some interest. The way to understand that is to, um, so I wrote this, this Gaussian composition, G was equal to upper triangular and diagonal lower triangular. But there was another way of, of splitting a G, which is to write it as a unitary matrix times an upper triangular. Mm. That's another way of splitting it. And then, on the, then I could try and realize the constraints in a different way, where um, the unitary part, uh, I'll find constraints that reduce that to the ordinary coset model that I was looking for, the parafermions. And the upper triangular part, I can relate to the rule of so, so that's the way of, of getting to the parafermionic description. OK. Uh, right, so for these, I, I did a lot of classical field theory here to, to compute this B. So I should expect that this is correct when B is large, not general. For large B, Central charge of this paratonic field is n n squared minus one times b plus b inverse squared, and this is exactly that same formula that we wrote down from the WCW model. So that gives a nice consistency check on one of these. Okay, so that, that kind of completes the derivation. You can generalize this Louisville analysis pretty easily to a TOTA analysis. A little more group theory, but not much more content. And, and for a theory to tell some SO5 parents or something from the rotation of the AS4? Does it have SO5 currents? No. You said that the compartification for the is SO3 to slash 4. Yeah, uh, but. But I mean, these fields, if we think about them geometrically, they, they were some fields that lived like right at the poles of the sphere. Right? They live at sigma equals zero and sigma equals pi. So they actually, they, they're just sort of stuck at the, at the edge. They don't, they don't have any interesting transformation property under the SO5. No, but at the end, when you get the two dimensional field, you want to put on sigma. Yeah, the, the, the SO5 doesn't act anymore. The, the, the fields are invariant of there. Okay, so that, that's the end of the derivation, and maybe for the last 10 minutes I'll tell you about some other application that you could do once you, once you know this. So this is all about some song and dance about a compactification of the 2-0 theory, but you could ask, what is it actually teaching us about the 2-0 theory itself? interesting application, the simple application, is to consider the half BPS local operators. In the 2-0 period. So what do they look like? Remember that the 2-0 theory has an SO5 R symmetry. The half BPS local operators, well, there's a scalar at the bottom of the total multiplet. Which is uh, in a symmetric tensor. 
of SO5. So these are, these are the possible, kinematically possible half BPS local operators. They obey the condition Q alpha I acting on this O is zero, where this symmetrization means largest representation. So these, these are the possible half BPS local operators in the 6203. And you can actually learn what they are just from this construction that we did. So there's a, we can consider an S5 times S1 partition function. Now, here I'm going to put supersymmetric boundary conditions here, and I'm going to view the local operators as the supersymmetric states on S5. So this is just the standard superconformal index. But there's a limit of this. It depends just on, uh, on one chemical potential. On a single variable Q. So it's trace minus 1 to the F because of the boundary conditions here, and then Q to the delta minus R, where this trace is over the uh, only the half PPS operators. And their derivatives. And this R counts how many vector indices you have there. So I claim that straight away we'll be able to compute this. Why? Well, again, we just do a little tiny geometry. Now we just get to do cartoons. So how do we think of S5? We think of S5 as you have an S3, and we fiber it over disk. This is S5, and then we multiply this whole thing times S1. That's the setup for what we've got here. So we've got S5 times S1. We want to consider the 2, 0 theory on this space. So how do we do it? Well, I just told you all about reducing on S3 and so forth. So let's first just reduce on that S3. So then we get, again, SLNC and Simons on a disk times S1. Now it was the round three sphere, so the continuous coupling is off, uh, and the k parameter is one. So we're in the simplest case of the ordinary total theory. Now we're, we have a manifold here with one boundary, and so we just do the analysis that we did again, but instead of getting the non-chiral theory, we now just get the chiral theory. up with the chiral Toda theory on the torus, S1 times S1. And so we can now just evaluate that partition function. That's a very standard partition function. We could call this partition function Z. The chiral sector of the Toda theory is just the standard W algebra. In fact, people have independently computed this. So that's a fun little application. We learn exactly what the set, this gives you the complete set 
of half PPS local operators in the 2-0 theory just from this kind of edge mode and trend sign analysis. So that's one interesting application. There are several others, but I don't have time to tell you about them today. But I'll stop. Oh yeah, I, yeah, 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 yeah. There's no difference. Uh, I, I just, I did the, this one just because the answers are making a little more familiar. Uh, but yeah, no, not really a significant difference for the beginning. And it's still terraforming on. Yeah, it's something. It something it's, it's slightly more strange, and I mean, it's basically still terraforming. It's just that those are slightly more strange. Can you understand how this stuff is not really Um, yeah. Well, we have... The surface operator is reduced to, uh, to Wilson lines in the 5 d networks. Sorry, I meant the, the code of engineering. Oh, uh... I think so, but we haven't studied it that much. I mean, it requires sort of doing nom poles along different directions. They re the surface operators are known to reduce to nom pole, nom poles in five dimensions. So you just have to do them in sort of different dimensions and see how that's been compatible with this construction. He's talking about M5s and M5s, code co dimension Not M5. Yeah, the, the things that are punctures in the in the Riemann surface.